So I'll kick the day off with uh, talking about top knee problems. Uh, first, disclosures are listed here. Uh, I don't think any are relevant to uh, what I'll be talking about today. So my goals for today, um, so musculoskeletal problems account for 30% of outpatient office visits, um, but musculoskeletal teaching only accounts for about 3% of the uh, usual medical school curriculum. Uh, and only 1% of an internal medicine curriculum. Um, and 56% of primary care physicians um, have reported that they don't feel prepared to really take care of musculoskeletal complaints as they need to once they're into practice. So we'll review common knee complaints, uh, go through diagnosis, treatment options, and then uh, the way I've tried to structure this is uh, some of the more common things, and then maybe a common thing that could present similarly, but with a few subtle differences that you want to pick up for possible earlier surgical referral uh, to make sure that we're not overlooking anything. Um, so the most common knee problems, I think one um, easy way to think about it is anatomically, just the different structures in the knee and then um, all the injuries that can come from each one of those. So uh, as we know, the knee is made up of um, the articular cartilage, uh, which can break down um, in the setting of arthritis or have an acute injury uh, with a, you know, acute cartilage injury. Uh, the meniscus um, sits between the femoral condyles and the tibial plateau, uh, shock absorber of the knee, and then can be torn. Um, the ACL uh, sitting centrally um, and uh, often torn in our athletic population. Uh, MCL, uh, our lateral ligamentous structures, the PCL behind. Uh, and then, you know, the patellofemoral joint is an important articulation that um, is definitely a common source of pain. So uh, first to start, um, we have a 52-year-old woman who comes in with right knee pain. Uh, she says, been present for three years, doesn't have a really specific inciting event. Uh, when asked about it, any injury that set this off, she describes an old injury that she had maybe in high school, uh, but really nothing since then. Uh, and then when you ask her where the pain is, she points to the inside part of her knee. It's worse with activity, and the knee feels stiff. Um, occasionally does have some swelling in the knee. Uh, on exam, she has slight varus alignment on standing, uh, pretty good range of motion, 0 to 125 degrees, and then um, her ligament exam is stable. So uh, we'll go to our first ARS question, but what's the most likely diagnosis for uh, this problem? All right, so 75% uh, with osteoarthritis, and I would agree with that. Uh, we have some with patellofemoral pain um, and uh, meniscus tear. I think you know, those could definitely be on our uh, list for uh, possible uh, differential diagnoses, but I would agree that this presentation is probably most consistent with um, osteoarthritis. So um, first off, knee arthritis is uh, a very important diagnosis for, uh, for all of us. So it's um, exceedingly common. Uh, patients have a 45% lifetime risk of developing symptomatic knee osteoarthritis. And the prevalence of knee OA is actually higher than uh, congestive heart failure, rheumatoid arthritis, um, other significant medical problems. Um, it's also disabling. So patients with knee osteoarthritis have lowest uh, health-related quality of life scores compared to other musculoskeletal conditions. Uh, it also has a negative effect on knee function and activity. So these patients, um, we see a lot of them, and then they're really quite affected by this condition. Uh, and then finally, it's a really costly condition. Um, there's a $12,000 annual cost for hip and knee osteoarthritis, uh, with really the primary driver being time away from work. Um, and when we uh, think about arthritis, so it's speaking earlier, so um, we have the articular cartilage lining the femoral condyle and the tibial plateau. And then um, if we go back to our histology, uh, so we have the articular cartilage, um, the hyaline cartilage that forms the structure. And um, it's important, it's, uh, the uh, friction is actually less than rubbing two pieces of ice together. It's incredibly smooth, um, lets that joint move. Um, and you know, with cartilage, so there's very few cells uh, which makes it really smooth, uh, but then we don't have great regenerative capabilities of it. So once the structure is injured, it's hard for the knee to, to bounce back and recover on its own. Uh, there's also no nerve in endings in cartilage. So it's good. We don't feel our joints moving back and forth all the time. Uh, but then we also don't sense that early damage and uh, the knee starts breaking down. Don't always know it as it's happening. Uh, and then I think, uh, you know, a good analogy when uh, talking to patients about um, arthritis uh, is talking about uh, the tread on the tires, uh, generally a concept that people can grasp and uh, I think really fits well with this. So uh, with a normal knee, you have nice, smooth cartilage, good, thick tread on the tires. 
Um, maybe you have a little hole developing, a uh, little, um, you know, if you have a little hole, we can often plug it on a tire, um, keep that tire in use and um, get you back on the road. Uh, we may be able to just plug this surgically, uh, just take care of that one focal problem. Uh, when the whole tread's gone though, um, really we gotta replace the tire. That's when you're looking at a knee replacement. Uh, so a good analogy when talking to patients about this. Uh, the symptoms that we see when people present with knee arthritis, so pain, swelling, knee effusion, uh, they'll often complain of stiffness, uh, decreased range of motion. Uh, depending on the pattern of their wear, if it's more on the medial compartment, they'll start noticing that they're more bow-legged. Uh, if it's on the lateral side, then um, start becoming more knock-kneed. Um, and patients will often complain that, uh, like, you know, with time, my knee's looking funny. And that's that progressive deformity as they're losing their joint space. Uh, they will describe an inability to exercise, perform daily activities, or even uh, function with their profession. Uh, and then weight gain is often associated with it. Uh, and then given these uh, other effects on physical function, um, depression is commonly seen in these patients too. Um, on exam, uh, so we'll often see that deformity. So it is important to have patients stand for you. Uh, so assess their standing alignment. Are they bow-legged, varus? Are they knock-kneed, valgus? Or uh, do they still have a neutral alignment? Uh, feeling their knee, you'll often be able to see, feel the crepitus. Uh, sometimes you can hear it too, but uh, just having them bend their knee back and forth, you can feel that popping and grinding. Uh, and then checking their range of motion. Um, it's not uncommon for patients to have bilateral um, knee arthritis, but uh, if you have one knee that's uh, quite a bit stiffer than the other, that's symptomatic knee, that's a good suggestion that this might be um, arthritis that you're looking at. And then uh, tenderness along the joint line. So, um, you know, we'll do the hands-on knee exam later today, but uh, practice finding the joint line and uh, pushing right on there with a patient with arthritis usually will provoke their pain. It's also one of the more sensitive tests in meniscal tears, but um, that's the affected area with arthritis and a good physical exam uh, maneuver. And so if you have a patient with knee pain, stiffness, swelling, this type of presentation, uh, I would recommend obtaining weight-bearing x-rays. Uh, our practice is to get bilateral views, um, especially with the PA bent knee. Uh, that allows for a comparison. Um, and so uh, when you're judging the joint space, you can see a really subtle loss if you have that contralateral knee that may be normal. Um, and then I really would emphasize the weight-bearing aspect of them. Uh, you can often have a patient supine with a non-weight-bearing view where their joint space looks relatively okay. They may have some osteophytes, but the joint space is... Um, is open, and then as soon as they put weight on it, it's collapsed, they're narrowed, and then you can see that it's more advanced arthritis. Uh, we'll often get um, x-rays even from uh, like an urgent care setting when somebody comes in with a complaint of knee pain and uh, they have supine x-rays that don't really tell the full story, so we're uh, repeating them uh, weight-bearing, and that shows the patient right away that uh, they don't have joint space left and really looking at uh, an arthritic diagnosis. Uh, so when we're looking at arthritis, uh, so this is just looking at an AP view of the knee, um, and on the left here, we have mild arthritis. Um, and here, you know, our joint space is pretty well maintained. And then coming here, now more moderate, so you can see um, the femoral condyle nearly touching the plateau. And then with severe arthritis, just have obliteration of that joint space and that bone-on-bone uh, -bone articulation. Um, so when managing um, knee osteoarthritis, uh, definitely the first-line treatment is non-operative management. And um, those treatments include a home exercise program, formal physical therapy, uh, NSAIDs, acetaminophen, uh, intraarticular steroid injection, weight loss, activity modification. Uh, one thing I think is really helpful, and I put this in there um, so you can have reference to it, um, but the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons has this um, appropriate use criteria tool online. Um, and you can go to this website, and then uh, you can kind of put in uh, what components are important to your patient, how severe their diagnosis is, and then it gives you that um, that list of recommended non-operative options. Um, so this can be, if you're thinking like, well, what is the best option for this, or is this treatment recommended, uh, go ahead and plug it in this diagnosis, or plug it in this tool, and uh, you can see kind of what those evidence-based um, treatments are for your specific patient. Uh, so that website's pretty useful. Um, physical therapy, uh, we definitely get a lot of patients who, when you propose uh, physical therapy, they're like, well, that's not going to do anything, but it, it really works. And um, there's multiple um, evidence-based studies that have shown uh, benefit to uh, physical therapy for especially early uh, mild to moderate arthritis. Um, so uh, just a couple highlighted here, but uh, exercise better than nothing for uh, early moderate arthritis. 
and then um, patients randomized to aerobic resistive exercises or nothing, and um, outcomes with pain daily function scores and significant improvements in outcome measures uh, and knee pain scores with exercise. Um, and then really the benefits are the best in mild to moderate osteoarthritis. So with that patient coming in with uh, maybe that first time presentation of the onset of knee arthritis, um, I definitely start them in a physical therapy program and encourage them with you know, evidence that this does help their symptoms. Uh, corticosteroid injections are another important um, treatment option. Um, they're powerful anti-inflammatory, can be delivered directly to the joint space, um, can improve pain, decrease inflammation. Um, they're great. I think they're cheap, they're safe, generally effective, and uh, really a good option. Um, there has been a recent study um, in JAMA, I believe last year, but a uh, randomized trial of a steroid injection every three months compared to a saline injection. Um, and there was no real difference in PROs, um, except the cartilage thickness on MRI in the steroid group um, was actually decreased over time. Uh, so, you know, we do know that cartilage, or steroid isn't great for cartilage. Basically, nothing is that you put into the joint. Um, but if you repeat these uh, over and over again, um, really may be doing more harm than good. Uh, but I do think a, a one-time injection for the inflamed knee, that person who can't start physical therapy or, you know, has some bigger event coming up that wants some symptomatic relief, uh, definitely a, a good option. Um, and then we'll be talking more about these, I think, at 2.15 um, in this room, so we um, can discuss more. Um, another injection option is um, hyaluronic acid. Um, so uh, HA is thought to act as a lubricant, stimulate more normal production of synovial fluid, and then has an anti-inflammatory effect. Uh, really, the evidence out there is uh, pretty variable on the impact of um, knee symptoms. Uh, there are some larger trials that really show no difference over time, uh, and a number of meta-analyses reaching those conclusions. Um, I think the, you know, we're learning more about this, and we'll uh, figure out its role uh, going forward. But um, I think the biggest issue right now for a lot of us is um, a lot of insurance companies aren't um, covering this either. So uh, it's still an option out there. It may not be... Um, uh, an available one for a lot of patients, so. Um, and then uh, another injection option uh, with a lot of interest right now, as Dr. Luke was saying, but it's uh, PRP, so platelet-rich plasma. And uh, this is one um, study on PRP versus HA, where uh, they randomized patients to um, receive either an HA or PRP injection for uh, mild to moderate knee arthritis. Um, and before and after, uh, really no difference between the two groups with their primary outcome measure of the Womack pain score. Um, what they did find, though, was um, that the um, IKDC score, which um, incorporates more activity, uh, was significantly better in the PRP group. And so the conclusions drawn from this were that, well, uh, maybe you can get these patients to be a bit more active, even if they have, are reporting that same symptom level. So they're doing more, uh, but still having some symptoms in the knee. Um, the other interesting thing about this study is they did look at the um, inflammatory cytokines in the knee at various time points, and they did find a positive effect from PRP uh, versus HA with that regard. So there does appear to be some biologic activity, um, but I think with PRP, we're still looking for uh, the appropriate indication and um, use of that. And um, in this, they also found, so it, the best effect was seen with mild arthritis, and then also patients with a lower BMI. Um, and um, did find that PRP favors um, HA for those specific indications. Uh, the other exciting area of injections, I think, is um, like a disease-modifying injection. Uh, so, um, you know, ideally we would alter the disease course through a cartilage degeneration pathway, and uh, that's, you know, what we've tried with PRP, other biologics, is trying to modulate that um, real arthritic response. Uh, and these, none are approved yet, uh, but at UCSF right now we are... Um, working on a clinical trial for um, injection through a company, Samumed. Um, it's a Wnt pathway inhibitor. Um, it's a treatment for pain associated with arth arthritis. And then there's some thought that there may be some role in cartilage regeneration. So uh, we're nearly finished recruiting with this one, um, but we've uh, been injecting patients with, with this one-time injection that um, inhibits that uh, Wnt pathway. And uh, I think this will be pretty exciting to see if this pans out or another um, injection in this, um, this class uh, is you know, there for the, uh, for future use. Uh, another common question that we get is uh, the role of bracing. Um, so uh, valgus offloading knee brace. Um, so um, 31 studies in this um, systematic review and um, unloader brace more effective at reducing pain than neutral brace in a, um, a neoprene sleeve. So if you have that unloading effect in the, um, in a varus knee, which is our most common um, pattern, 
but real, no difference in knee stiffness, and then uh, poor compliance in actual use. So uh, for the really motivated patient who says, you know, my knee is okay, but when I hike, uh, when I'm more active, I really can't put up with the pain I have. Um, I have this varus pattern, my pain is medial, and yes, I really do want to wear that brace. Uh, this can be a good option. Uh, for most of our patients, though, uh, it's going to be the type of thing that they get the brace, they try it once, they hate it, put it in the closet, and then um, spent a lot of money on something they'll never use. Um, so I would just carefully select your patients, but it can be a, um, a good treatment. Um, and then, unfortunately, um, arthroscopic surgery is not a, a treatment for knee osteoarthritis. So we get a lot of patients who still ask, you know, oh, can I just get my knee cleaned up? Uh, you know, there's bone spurs, you just shave them down, that's got to make it better. And uh, there have been a number of studies, and uh, this is just one of them, but um, randomizing um, knee arthroscopy versus um, physical therapy medications uh, for knee OA. And um, really, if you look at their response over time, can't even tell the difference which group is which at any point. Um, and so um, really no difference in two-year outcomes and uh, would not recommend um, knee arthroscopy for management of arthritis. Um, and then the, the real surgical tra treatment when looking at knee arthritis is a knee replacement. Uh, excellent treatment for pain from end-stage arthritis. And uh, more info to come with Derek Ward speaking at 935, so stay tuned there. All right, so let's go to our next case. So uh, case number two, I hurt my knee. So we have this same 52-year-old woman. She comes in with right knee pain. Um, this patient says she felt a pop three weeks ago when walking. And again, she may have had an old injury to her knee in high school, and uh, pain, again, is located on the inside part of the knee, worse with activity, and she says it's been very swollen. Um, on physical exam, slight varus alignment, uh, range of motion 0 to 125 degrees, stable ligamentously, she's tendered out along the medial joint line, and she has a moderate effusion. Uh, so what's our most likely diagnosis here? All right, meniscus root tear, great. So 63% with that, and then um, sort of scattered uh, answers otherwise, but uh, I would agree that this is uh, looking like a root tear. Um, and so highlighted a few things here that I think uh, are important to distinguish this patient from our first case. Uh, so that description of the pop, um, so that acute injury, and especially a pop like, with a low-level trauma is something that we see with meniscus root tears. Um, the knee's been very swollen, and that's something else that you see after that uh, root tear injury. Um, again, tender to palpation along the medial joint line uh, and a moderate effusion on exam. So uh, pop, swollen knee, low-level trauma, um, and uh, joint line tenderness uh, really should keep that diagnosis in your head. Um, so what is a meniscus root tear? So we're increasingly recognizing these as an injury, um, especially in patients in their fourth, fifth decades um, or later. Um, we see it with a low-level trauma, just walking, stepping off a curb, something like that, and um, often presents with a moderate to large effusion. Um, and this is just an arthroscopic video looking at the cartilage here, but um, in the back um, can see um, that detachment um, right back here. Um, the meniscus is not attached to bone as it should be, so uh, that meniscus is pulled off and can't function as that shock absorber in the knee anymore. Uh, meniscus tears in general, so we see these as um, occurring after a rotation of the femur against a fixed tibia uh, during flexion and extension, so just twisting on the knee. Um, and with clinical signs, we'll see joint line pain, uh, the knee giving way, clicking, um, and swelling especially. Uh, and then if the knee is uh, locked, um, that may suggest that there's a displaced piece of the meniscus, like a bucket handle tear. Uh, that's something that we want to get to sooner in a surgical fashion. Uh, so the meniscus works uh, to protect articular cartilage by decreasing the contact pressure in the knee. Uh, and the meniscus root is the bony attachment at the front and the back. Uh, so just here and here, um, the meniscus just attaches directly to bone. Uh, and then along the periphery, it's just attached to the capsule. But you have these secure attachment points at the front and the back. And uh, basically, if that meniscus root tears, it's um, essentially the same as taking out the whole meniscus uh, because it can't... Um, um, resist those hoop stresses anymore. It can't, anytime you load it, that, um, that area that's torn just displaces. And it can be difficult to diagnose on MRI unless you're really looking for it. Uh, and then it can also lead to the rapid development of arthritis, which is our um, biggest concern with these injuries. And um, in general for meniscus tears, our treatment's based on uh, mechanical symptoms in the tear pattern. 
And if the meniscus tear disrupts the mechanics, the patient does not respond to physical therapy, then surgery is indicated. Um, the surgical options, uh, we can clean it up or repair it. Um, and then the meniscus root, though, we're really a lot more aggressive with fixing these. Um, if the patient has maintained joint spaces, if they don't have arthritis yet, uh, we're really pushing to fix these and do that in a, um, an early fashion. Um, the reason why is um, at 10 years, the rates of osteoarthritis uh, with non-operative treatment of a meniscus root tear, uh, 95% um, and 99% with a meniscectomy, and then 53% with uh, meniscus repair. Um, and meniscus repair, what they found is uh, it's cost saving, and then it can decrease the likelihood of a knee replacement surgery. So that 40, 50 year old patient who has that meniscus root tear, um, who still does not have arthritis, um, we can um, really change the natural history of that uh, disease course uh, by intervening and fixing that meniscus. Um, and just uh, one example, this is a patient um, who um, had a twisting injury, um, good joint space at this point, and um, this is an MRI, so this coronal sagittal MRI, and right here you can see that meniscus detached from bone. Uh, and just four months later, uh, we have narrowing of the medial joint line, and then she was headed towards a, a partial knee replacement. Um, significant pain, um, really decreased activities, and um, uh, pretty limited by her um, medial side and knee pain. So uh, with a patient like this, 52-year-old, twisting injury, moderate effusion, joint line tenderness, and uh, maintained joint spaces on a weight-bearing x-ray, uh, I would recommend an MRI in this situation. So get that to evaluate the meniscus and the cartilage. Um, and then even if, if you have this story, put on your requisition, uh, suspect medial meniscus root tear, or lateral meniscus root tear, uh, where the pain is, just to um, make sure that the radiologist keeps that in the back of their head too, and they're really looking for it, because they can be missed. Uh, and then if that's the diagnosis, I would have them uh, decrease their activity level, uh, or even have uh, protected weight bearing with uh, crutches or a walker, and then would uh, recommend um, early referral to an orthopedic surgeon to discuss possible uh, surgical treatment. Uh, this is what we're able to do surgically. So this top picture, uh, this is looking in the medial compartment of the knee. So femur here, tibia here, and this is the meniscus. And then that gap is where that meniscus is torn off of bone. Uh, this is looking just directly down on it. So meniscus here, and then this is a little residual attached where the root is, uh, femoral condyle, and then the tibia below. But that gap, that tear right there should not be there. Uh, we're able to use little suture passers to put stitches in that, and then uh, we can drill a little tunnel up through the tibia, um, pull stitches down, and then tie that back so it's, again, securely fixed to bone. And then that restores those, um, the mechanics of the meniscus and um, kind of protects that cartilage still. All right, so next case, my knee hurts. So 28-year-old woman and comes in with bilateral knee pain. Uh, she said no specific injury but recently increased mileage. Uh, pain is vague towards the front of the knee, worse with stills or stairs and hills, and uh, worse after sitting. Uh, no swelling, no instability, no locking, no catching. Um, on exam, full range of motion, normal alignment, uh, no patellar instability, uh, just kind of a little sore along the patella, medially and laterally, and no effusion. And so the most likely diagnosis here is our same six choices, meniscus tear, patellar cartilage injury, knee OA, ACL tear, patellofemoral pain, MCL tear. <coughs> All right, great. So patellofemoral pain syndrome. And um, I think the, you know, the key points in this history and exam, so uh, patellofemoral pain often presents bilaterally. Um, no specific injury, but may have a, a change in activities to prompt this. And then um, worse with uh, activities that are really putting more force across that articulation, so stairs, hills, inclines. Uh, and then really common to have that uh, pain after sitting for prolonged periods of time. Um, importantly, no swelling. Um, so I do always ask patients, like, does your knee swell up? After activities, do you have, uh, does your knee feel puffy? Does it look uh, swollen? Because um, that can really suggest a cartilage problem. Uh, and then um, oftentimes these patients are just tender along the patella, but um, again, no effusion. So patellofemoral pain syndrome, uh, most common diagnosis for knee pain in the outpatient setting. Uh, so this is what we'll see most of the time. And then it's uh, been reported as high as 16 to 25% of injuries in runners. Um, and it's often atraumatic, uh, maybe ch associated with that change in activity level, either unilateral or commonly bilaterally, and then um, activity-related pain and worse with um, stairs and inclines. Um, there's symptoms, so they'll describe pain behind the patella towards the front of the knee. Um, it's often vague, um, kind of hard to localize, and then prolonged sitting and then no swelling or catching. 
And uh, on exam, um, so the standing alignment um, should be neutral. Um, and sometimes these patients will have knee valgus, foot pronation, and uh, those do contribute to the overall kinetic chain, chain of the knee. Uh, and then it's important to look for dynamic patellar tracking. Uh, so have the patient seated and ask them to just flex and extend their knee. And then does their knee, does their patella jump out as they're reaching extension, that J sign, or does it track centrally down the trochlea? Uh, would look at their quadriceps muscle. Um, is it atrophic, um, and especially the VMO medially? Uh, and then range of motion should be full. Um, a lot of patients do have crepitus of the patellofemoral joint. Uh, it's, it's not diagnostic for or against patellofemoral pain syndrome and uh, doesn't necessarily say they have arthritis, but um, if it's a lot of crepitus, that may suggest they have some degenerative changes there. Uh, and then it's worth checking tightness of the quads, IT band, hamstrings, um, and then also patellar tilt. So uh, treating patellofemoral pain syndrome, uh, first thing is identifying the inciting event. So this patient ramping up her mileage, like let's cut back build your strength and then get you back up to uh, where you wanna be. Uh, but just progressing through, um, not gonna really cause further injury. So if she's got the marathon next week wondering, can I do it? Yes, it might hurt, but you can do it safely. Uh, but if you wanna get rid of the symptoms, uh, drop back down and uh, build strength back up. And then um, physical therapy is really our mainstay here. So uh, focusing on patellar mechanics and control, uh, quad strengthening, especially the VMO, um, stretching for the lateral structures, and then hip abductor strengthening. Um, I'll often have patients do a single leg squat, um, and usually they're collapsing in, that um, abductor function is pretty poor, and that uh, reinforces the patient right then too that uh, I can make that better, and then uh, they'll usually see their pain get better as their hip abduction strength gets better. Uh, does PT work? Um, yes. So uh, patients randomized to hip strengthening versus uh, control uh, eight-week program. Um, improvements in pain and health status sustained at six months follow-up. So um, again, it, when patients come in with this complaint and say, well, I'm not sure that that's really going to take care of my problem. I need something else. Say, no, we've got good evidence to support that um, this will solve the problem that you have, make you feel better, and get you back to where you should be. All right. So... Uh, case number four, um, anterior knee pain again, but a few details change. Uh, so 28-year-old again, uh, now right knee pain. Uh, no specific injury, but she's recently increased her mileage in running. Uh, vague pain towards the front of the knee, worse with still stairs and hills, uh, worse after sitting. Um, the knee swells with activity, and then she feels catching occasionally with range of motion. Um, on exam, again, full range of motion, normal alignment, no instability, and just tender uh, along the patella medially and laterally. And then this, you do kind of think she has a mild effusion. Um, so most likely diagnosis here would be All right, patellar cartilage injury, great. That's what I was looking for. And um, so with this, now we're looking at a unilateral problem. Um, I have definitely taken care of patients with bilateral um, patellar cartilage injuries, um, but a lot of times when we have something like this, it will be um, more commonly unilaterally. Um, importantly, when you ask her about swelling, uh, she does say, yes, my knee does puff up when I, every time I run. Um, and that swelling is just a sign that there's something intraarticularly that isn't handling that load, uh, reacting um, accordingly, and then um, important to, to really ask about. And then the catching, um, that can uh, indicate loose cartilage is something in the knee that's blocking that motion. And then again, on exam, finding that mild effusion is important. Uh, so patellofemoral cartilage injuries, these can be from an acute injury um, or from chronic wear. So they'll often happen uh, patellar dislocation. Uh, the patella goes out laterally, and then you can knock off a piece of the lateral facet at that time. Uh, or it can just be from lateral maltracking, um, overload of the lateral facet, and um, that's going to be where we most commonly see problems, but um, can be anywhere on the patella. Uh, so with this, so activity-related swelling, catching, locking with motion, and normal x-rays um, would um, recommend obtaining an MRI to better evaluate the cartilage, and then um, based on those results and what the patient um, thinks, would consider referring to a surgeon. Uh, so here... We have a normal x-ray looking at the patellofemoral articulation, so good joint space between them, no osteophytes, uh, preserved space. Uh, and then we get the MRI, and so looking at an axial T2 um, image, so femur here, patella, and here's the medial facet with that nice gray stripe of cartilage, and then the, this area of the lateral facet is just devoid of cartilage, so you have that um, all the way down to, to bone, a full thickness uh, cartilage defect. 
uh, treating these, uh, we uh, do have some options and um, can you know, successfully treat these. So one of the mainstays is realignment of the tibial tubercle. Uh, so we do this with an anterior medialization. So oftentimes these patients are tracking laterally. So we move the patellar tendon and the tibial tubercle medially. And then that makes the patella track more down the middle. So you're taking pressure off the affected area. Uh, we also bring it forward. So the anteriorization part, and that just decreases the load across that joint. Uh, so you're offloading the kneecap. So less pressure on the cartilage, better tracking. And that really helps with outcomes. Um, so we're able to just make a cut in the tubercle, shift it over, and then uh, put a screw down it to fix it. Uh, we can also restore cartilage now in the uh, patellofemoral joint. Um, so there's uh, one procedure called MACI, um, where we can biopsy cartilage cells. Um, the patient's knee, so arthroscopy to do that, send that to a lab, and then they grow those cells in culture, and then they can send us back an implant that we're able to put in. Um, and that can successfully restore like a hyaline cartilage to the knee again, uh, which is pretty exciting. And uh, so this is one such patient, the patient's MRI that we were just looking at. And so again, so this is looking at the patella, so good cartilage around, and then have this area completely down to bone. Um, this person can't do their activities, um, their knee swells up every time to try to do something, really bothered by this. Uh, so this first procedure, uh, figure out, is this the right thing to do? Is this, um, you know, does this look like the MRI? And then uh, take that cartilage biopsy, so just from an area that is a non-weight-bearing area, and then send that off to the lab. Uh, and then we're able to do surgery where this is now open and have that area of cartilage, and then we fill that with um, that implant. So uh, we can now resurface that area. Um, and the results with this are um, really pretty good. Um, you know, this is a bigger problem to deal with, but um, we can get uh, good results with it. So um, this is a multi-center study and uh, looking at um, ACI, the previous generation of this technology, but uh, specifically in the patella. And uh, we see significant improvements in pain and function. Um, it usually is combined with that um, osteotomy. So if you're tracking improperly and you just resurface it, you're probably just gonna wear that down again. And what we're putting on isn't as good as what the patient had initially. So uh, we do usually change their alignment to uh, protect it. Uh, but only 8% failure and then 92% of the patients said that they would have the treatment again with um, you know, our PROs are listed through here and good improvement in those. All right, so next case, case number five. <coughs> I was playing soccer. So a 26-year-old man uh, comes in with a right knee injury, playing soccer three days ago. Uh, he had a contact injury. Another player slid into his leg. Um, doesn't think that he heard a pop, um, but isn't really sure. It all happened pretty quickly. Uh, has pain on the inside part of the knee. Um, he was unable to keep playing, um, but did not notice any swelling in the knee afterwards. Uh, the knee has been feeling better, but still just not back to normal. On his exam, range of motion, 0 to 100 degrees. Uh, he's tender along the medial femur and the medial aspect of the joint. Uh, no effusion. Uh, has pain with valgus stress testing, but no gapping, and a negative Lachman. So, diagnosis here. All right, so 78% with MCL, and I agree with that. Um, so the key point, so contact injury, uh, so that's going to be our more common mechanism for an MCL tear. Uh, and then interestingly, when people are playing, like they've found um, a higher uh, prevalence of injury like towards the end of the first half in professional soccer. So uh, while patients get fatigued, they're more uh, likely to have this, like the protective mechanisms are uh, decreased and then uh, more prone to injury. Uh, pain on the inside part of the knee, so the MCL's uh, medial structure, and then um, unable to keep playing, but no swelling. So that's important. It's an extraarticular structure, uh, so we don't get that large effusion. And then um, on exam, pain with a valgus stress test, uh, but his knee's still stable, which is good. So the uh, usual mechanism for the MCL uh, being hit on the outside of the knee, and then the knee being uh, driven into a valgus position. Uh, it may be associated with tears of the ACL, medial meniscus, lateral meniscus, or a patellar dislocation. So always important to look for those. Um, and uh, may have a contusion or fracture due to the impact. <coughs> and uh, MCL is the most commonly injured knee ligament. Um, and you know, when we look at it anatomically, uh, so this is our usual mechanism. So uh, hit from the outside of the knee, knee driven into valgus, and then um, just increased stress at these structures. Uh, we have a superficial MCL, and then there's a deep MCL under it. That superficial is the most important uh, mechanically. And then there's also a posterior oblique ligament that um, comprises or um, concludes that uh, medial structure. 
Uh, so medial sided knee pain, um, and then they'll all complain of things like, you know, when my foot gets caught in the covers, when I'm lifting my knee, when I'm getting into the car, uh, things like that uh, provoking the pain also. Uh, most commonly, the ligaments injured at the femoral side. Uh, so when you're examining them, they'll have pain um, at the medial epicondyle. Um, it is important to palpate distally. Sometimes they do tear off the tibial side. Um, important to recognize that as a, those don't heal as well non-surgically. Um, swelling, not as common, but these knees get pretty stiff, um, especially with uh, grade two, grade three injury. Um, and then the differentiating these between um, medial meniscus tears uh, based on the injury mechanism uh, and then also the clinical exam. So remember that medial meniscus injury, um, you'll have that joint line tenderness, that pain medially, uh, but really that's gonna be a twisting injury. Um, not that like my knee was swept to the side or you know I fell and it buckled in, something like that. Uh, so valgus stress test is the main way to diagnose this. And uh, this is just with um, applying a valgus stress in full extension um, and 20 to 30 degrees of flexion. So the, the MCL is most active. Um, it's best to isolate in slight flexion. That's why we do that 20 to 30 degrees. Um, and then we will grade it based on um, how much the joint space opens. Uh, and then also if there's an endpoint. And um, treating these, so um, for higher grade injuries, um, we'll put these patients in a brace and have them be non-weight bearing uh, or weight bearing and extension. And then uh, get them started in physical therapy for motion and strengthening. Uh, and then usually uh, a grade one, two injury uh, for most of our recreational athletes is um, taking six, 12 weeks to get back to sports. Uh, grade one injury in a uh, higher level athlete, we can get them back in a couple weeks even. And then um, we don't always need advanced imaging for an MCL injury, um, but um, would say uh, you should think about getting advanced imaging um, if you're not sure or if there's a joint effusion, a block to motion should certainly prompt it. And then if you feel um, any instability in testing the other ligamentous structures, uh, then would encourage um, obtaining an MRI to uh, better evaluate those structures. Uh, but for a routine grade one, grade two MCL injury, um, no need, and then could save the MRI only if they're not improving. Um, these are just MRIs looking. So this is a normal MCL here, that nice black structure running through here. Uh, and then here, MCL is disrupted at the femoral side. Um, most of these uh, we are able to treat successfully non-surgically. So a grade one injury um, can have a knee sleeve plus or minus physical therapy and then you know that quicker recovery. Uh, grade two injury uh, brace and we'll uh, usually go for a, a short hinge knee brace uh, and then um, use that for six weeks and get started in physical therapy. And then if it's an isolated grade three injury um, it, where you feel no endpoint on exam, um, probably should get uh, an MRI. Uh, his, it's pretty uncommon to have a grade three in isolation. Uh, there may be a secondary injury to the knee. Uh, and then would brace these patients in extension. Um, and um, these will take a longer time to heal. And then if the, the MCL is trapped in the joint, which can happen, or if it's pulled off the tibial side, uh, those are ones that we'll probably want to fix surgically. Uh, definitely if it's trapped in the joint, and then usually if it's pulled off the tibial side. All right, so back to the soccer field, a few details change. So 26-year-old man again, playing soccer three days ago, uh, but this guy um, no, wasn't hit by anyone, non-contact injury, felt a pop, pain on the inside part of his knee, unable to keep playing, uh, lots of swelling shortly after injury, and then the knee's been feeling better, but still not back to normal. Uh, range of motion again, zero to 100 degrees. Uh, he's tender medially, moderate effusion. Um, stable to varus and valgus stress, but has a 2B Lachman. All right. So process of elimination. <laughs> All right, ACL tear. Uh, so you know the things to, to highlight. So again, non-contact twisting injury. So that's going to be our most common mechanism for an ACL tear. Um, patients do feel a pop. Uh, it's probably the uh, femur and the tibia hitting each other with the injury, um, but uh, that's a good question to, to ask because uh, most of the time they did. Um, I think it, it's important to ask if they were able to keep playing. Um, a lot of meniscus tears, cartilage injuries, the patient will be able to go back and play. They say, yeah, something didn't quite feel right, but I felt I could keep going. And uh, an ACL, they say, you know, yeah, I was able to start walking afterwards, but no way, I couldn't trust my knee, I wasn't able to go back in. And then uh, these patients will have a lot, often will have a lot of swelling um, and starts shortly after the injury, either you know, within a couple hours or that night, uh, but the knee gets um, pretty big. On their exam, especially three days after, they'll often still have that swelling. And then um, the Lachman test is gonna be our best and a 2B would say that their ACL is torn. 
So 70% uh, with a pop, swelling within an hour, don't return to play, and then um, really often doing well by the time they make it in to see us. Uh, so with this type of presentation, I think it's important to highlight just the differential for a large and acute traumatic effusion. Uh, so that patient who says, I injured my knee, and then within a couple hours, my knee was swollen. Um, it's really going to be something along this list. So an ACL injury will give it to you. Uh, there's a blood supply from the middle geniculate artery. And uh, when the ACL is torn, that can just bleed into the knee, giving you that hemarthrosis. Uh, patellar dislocation will give you that large amount of swelling, um, as well as patellar tendon tear, quadriceps tendon tear, uh, or a fracture osteochondral injury. So if they say, yes, my knee blew up, it was big, and um, it's going to be one of these, and make sure you're going through these, especially um, these extensor mechanism injuries. Uh, sometimes that story can sound like an ACL. Like I went up for a layup in basketball and came down my knee. I felt a pop. My knee was swollen. Just make sure you're having them do a um, straight leg raise. Make sure that extensor mechanism is intact because that can be missed early on. So check extensor mechanism function, uh, check a Lachman for an ACL injury, um, and then check the uh, patellar um, translation and apprehension, um, and that will tip you off whether this was a patellar dislocation, and then uh, we'll use radiographs to evaluate for a fracture. Uh, and so uh, on the exam, they'll usually have a swollen knee, and they'll lack motion, and then be uh, tender laterally, and then um, usually we're able to pick up um, instability on exam. This one you know, is pretty profound, but uh, this is our Lachman test, so 20 to 30 degrees, and then um, just holding the femur fixed, and the examiner just pulls the tibia forward. Um, X-rays are usually non-diagnostic, but uh, can help rule in or out associated injuries. Uh, we will occasionally see a Sagan fracture, this little chip off the lateral tibial plateau, a little piece of the capsule that pulls off um, with an ACL injury. And if that's there, uh, it's pathognomonic for an ACL injury. Uh, on MRI, um, sorry, these don't project that well, but hopefully better on the online version, but um, here centrally, we just have complete disruption of the, the ACL, and then um, in the lateral compartment, have bone bruising at the lateral, anterior aspect of the lateral femoral condyle, and then posteriorly, and this is uh, where the, you know, the femur and tibia contact when the tibia slides forward due to the um, ACL injury. So um, ACL tears, they can be managed non-operatively, um, so especially our low demand uh, patients um, can be treated with activity modification, possible bracing for activity, and then surgical treatment, um, so patients who want to return to cutting, pivoting sports, so this guy playing soccer, if he's, his goal is to get back there playing soccer again, um, he's going to end up with more meniscus cartilage injuries if he goes back ACL deficient. Um, high demand jobs, so police officers, firefighters, uh, patients like that, we do treat them like elite athletes and that they need the uh, cruciate ligaments to be able to do um, everything that uh, they need to. Um, young people were a lot more aggressive because we know they are going to keep doing these things and um, it is chondroprotective and um, decreases meniscal injuries. Um, and then if they already have cartilage meniscus injuries, probably good to um, point them towards ACL reconstruction. So it's just arthroscopically torn ACL. Uh, we're able to drill tunnels in the femur and the tibia and then um, pull in a new tendon. Um, and with these, we're uh, generally getting people back to running about four months after surgery and then um, getting them back to cutting, pivoting sports uh, somewhere around the nine-month mark, but really depends on how they're progressing functionally afterwards. All right, so quick summary, and then I'm happy to take any questions too. Uh, but um, with this, hope understand the common presentation for common problems, um, arthritis, patellofemoral pain syndrome. Um, I do think it's important um, always, if the patient can, uh, request weight-bearing views. Um, oftentimes people, um, like the um, radiology tech or the um, x-ray facility may default to a supine view, but um, really ask for uh, weight-bearing radiographs uh, to give a, the best evaluation of joint space if they're able to, to bear weight. Um, keep root tears in the back of your head for um, those patients with that story like we talked about, because uh, if we can pick that up, we can really change the natural history of uh, rapid onset of arthritis. Uh, if the patient has an effusion, um, should um, prompt concern for a meniscus cartilage injury, other art intra-articular injury, and then um, really want to get an MRI, um, as long as they have normal x-rays, but get that MRI to um, clarify exactly what it is and what we can do to help it, and then uh, keep that differential in mind for um, an acute traumatic effusion. So with that, thank you, and happy to take any questions if we have time.